Should I start or is someone going to introduce me? I just, just introduce you, please. Uh, just to say that it's an honor to us to receive you again in the second lecture that uh, you're going to talk about isotope separation, Maxwell demo, and the points, points Man Foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about something different. And notice that it doesn't really have anything to do with quantum fluids, but uh, this work did grow out of the work on cooling atoms that I spoke about yesterday. And so maybe it's an example of, of sometimes you start one thing and it leads you to some unexpected path. And, uh, and eventually, uh, as, as we might see, isotopes could be relevant even to quantum fluids. But uh, today I want to pick up roughly from yesterday and continue the discussion of Maxwell's demon uh, in a different context, and that is for isotope separation. And before I start, I want to say that today is a very special day. It's 22222. And you'll never have this day again. So try to remember this day for this reason, and maybe also because of my talk. I don't know, but certainly this is a special day. Okay. All right. So the word isotope uh, should be familiar to all of you. Uh, I'm surprised sometimes, though, when I talk to people not in physics or not in science, and when I say the word isotope, they, they get a scared look. They're not sure what I'm talking about. So the word uh, comes from the Greek. Uh, isos means equal, and topos means place, isotopos. Maybe that's how even it's said in Portuguese, I believe. But uh, in English, we call it isotope or isotopes. And they were discovered by this man, by Frederick Soddy, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for, in 1921. And, uh, and, and this has been little, just about 100 years now. We're celebrating uh, maybe a little over 100 years of isotopes. So... The most familiar isotope to you might be carbon. Uh, we have uh, carbon has six protons and six neutrons, the most common form of carbon, which is carbon-12. Carbon-13 is a much lower natural abundance, but it's also a stable isotope. It has six protons and seven neutrons, and carbon-14 is a radioisotope for a very long half-life. It's used for, for radiological dating. It has six protons and eight neutrons. So isotopes differ from one another only by the number of neutrons in the nucleus, which changes their mass slightly, depending on the, on the mass of the isotope, and, um, and changes their nuclear properties. Their chemical properties, however, are almost the same. Now, this fact makes them actually very difficult to separate. It's like, like having twins. You can't tell them apart very easily. Maybe their mother can, but, uh, but otherwise it's hard to tell them apart and that's why it's hard to separate them. As an example, uh, here's some calcium. This is calcium, pure calcium, which is an alkaline earth. And uh, the latest price I found on one of the vendors was about four and a half dollars per kilogram. And what if we can take one of the rare isotopes of calcium? Calcium has a stable isotope, which is calcium-48. It's about 0.2% abundant. So only one out of 500 calcium atoms are calcium-48. It's, it's of interest for fundamental measurements uh, in physics and, uh, and nuclear physics. What's the price of calcium-48? Well, I don't, if you could get a kilogram, I don't know if you could, it would be worth $130 million. So you can't explain that by the natural abundance because if you take, if you take four and a half dollars and multiply by 500, that's, um, that's $2,500. So it does not explain it by the natural abundance, but somehow it's because it's considered such a difficult task. So that's the key question that I want to start out with, is how to separate isotopes. Now, there are two methods. The first, which you have undoubtedly heard of, is the gas centrifuge. 
And that was developed mostly after World War II, roughly in the 50s. Uh, and today it's used mostly for one element, and that's uranium in the form of a gas, uh, uranium hexafluoride. It's, not, it's used for a few other elements, but it's not a general method. So in order to use the gas centrifuge, the gas, the uh, element must be in gas phase at room temperature. So noble gases like argon or uh, xenon can be separated, krypton. But most elements are not in gas phase at room temperature, and they may not have molecular compounds that are gas phase. E Use uranium hexafluoride, U, uh, UF6. Uh, as the gas. So instead, there's a general purpose machine, which is known as the Calutron. Calutron actually was invented by this man, Ernest Lawrence, who's most famous for the cyclotron. Uh, he invented in the 1930s and 40s, uh, he developed what's called the Calutron. And initially, it was also developed to separate uranium. And it was used for that purpose until after World War II. But then uh, and then, then the centrifuge became much more efficient for that purpose. Uh, the Calutron, the word, the origin of the word is Cal stands for California, U stands for uranium, and Tron stands for Tron. I don't know. Okay, so the, how does a Calutron work? Well, it's, it's basically a large mass spectrometer. So you start out by, uh, by um, starting with a source of atoms in, a, in an oven. You heat them up to make gas phase, and then you ionize them, creating what we call an ion source, where the ions are accelerated to tens of kilovolts here, 35 kilovolts. These ions then enter a region of a very large magnetic field over one Tesla, over a large volume, which is uh, many cubic meters shown schematically by these coils with thousands of amps flowing. And because of the crossed electric and magnetic fields, the charged particles take a, a, a curved circular path that depends on their charge to mass ratio. So the lighter ions will have a smaller radius of curvature than the heavier ions. And in that way, the, the atoms, the ions are separated by, by their charge to mass. And since charge is, is the same because they're singly ionized, you can collect them in different pockets. And that is how you separate these isotopes. Now, the, uh, this is a modern calutron. And I put the word modern in italics. Um, but, but pretty much because this basically, this is like... Uh, second generation. So Lawrence's version was in the 1930s and 40s. This is a 1950 version. And pretty much this is the way it operates today. Uh, it hasn't changed hardly at all in, in 70 years. Uh, and uh, if you see that you've got a, um, uh, the, the picture that I showed before on the left-hand side, and then large vacuum pumps. In fact, they use diffusion pumps. So why is, this, uh, why is this used? Well, up till recently, it was the only method for, for um, isotope separation, um, which uh, does work. Um, and it achieves pretty high isotopic purity, at least for the lower masses. But um, I'm using green as good and red as bad. Uh, the scalability to required quantities is poor. So you can't, and it really is limited by the ion current, and you can't really increase that without building more machines. And the efficiency and cost is very, very because the energy of, of maintaining such a large magnetic field over large volumes is very high. Now, tried other methods. There was a long, big effort in the 90s to use laser ionization, multi-photon ionization, and ultimately it failed because the ionization is very difficult uh, and it's not scalable. The lasers, the laser intensity requirements were, were uh, very difficult to maintain. And so people gave up on laser ionization. Now the Calutron is 
used for many elements in the periodic table. I've listed here 36. There's probably more that I haven't counted, but it's, it's useful for pretty much elements that cannot be uh, done on the centrifuge, cannot be done on the centrifuge, the alkali atoms, the alkaline earths, metals, uh, the lanthanides, what we call rare earths. Uh, so many, many elements, and probably there's many more that I haven't even listed. So it is a general purpose machine. Now, what makes isotopes valuable beyond just having stable isotopes of the elements is the fact that we can produce radioactive or what are called radioisotopes from stable isotopes. And for example, uh, on the left hand side, we have a picture of a medical cyclotron. Again, again this is Lawrence's in invention that accelerates protons medical cyclotron energy is typically around 15 to 20 MeV. Uh, and on the right is a is looking down at the core of a nuclear reactor. You can see the blue Cherenkov radiation uh, light emitted. And uh, that is used to, uh, uh, the neutron flux from the reactor is used in this case. I would say that the the, the reactor is, is, is used for a long, isotopes that have a relatively long half-life of many days to weeks or more, whereas the cyclotron is used for isotopes that have to be produced on site that have lifetimes of, of minutes because they, and they are, you'll find these medical cyclotrons at, at almost every major or every major hospital produces those. Sorry. So there's a long-standing dream uh, which was expressed beautifully in this painting by Joseph Wright of Derby from 1771, named The Alchemist. There was a belief that you could do alchemy, that is, you could, you could change one element into another. The dream was you could take a base metal like lead and turn it into a, a precious metal like gold. That's what we see here. In fact, even Sir Isaac Newton believed that, uh, that alchemy is possible. And he spent many years trying, but he failed. In a way, we can call what we're doing today as nuclear alchemy, and it really works. We can take one element and we can turn it into another element. Of course, it, it might be expensive to do it, but it can be done. So isotopes, in fact, are a great resource that until now have not been really utilized properly. And I'll give some examples, but they are used for uh, radioisotopes for cancer therapy. Uh, stable isotopes are used for uh, addressing malnutrition due to deficiency of minerals. Uh, it's used for medical imaging, uh, basic science, and even new materials. But the problem is there's a worldwide supply crisis of enriched isotopes. And that's because the calutron even though the calutron was invented in the U.S., in the late 90s, the largest large calutrons in the U.S. at Oak Ridge National Lab, they uh, shut down because they were so expensive to run. And today, the only large calutron facility operates in Russia. And with the news coming out of Ukraine, I think we understand that this is not a very reliable supply and probably with sanctions, we will not even be able to get those isotopes anymore, at least for a while. So there was a long-standing recognition that there's an urgent need for new methods. This was explained in detail in a study, uh, several studies. This was from 2008. Every six years, this advisory committee is called, it's called the, um, uh, it's the advisory committee to the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, and they write a report. And this report was from 2008. They had a 2015 one and now they're about to come out with a new one. The newest one actually mentions our work, so it's nice. Uh, they they describe the crisis and that, that we're running out of isotopes. With that as a background, um, it, it is clear that we need a new method and there hasn't been a new method for over 80 years. So that is a, that's a surprising thing that, that Technology does not really advance in that long, in 80 years. So what I'm uh, going to tell you about today is our work 
and how Maxwell's demon is used to very efficiently separate isotopes. And the method that we developed, invented, we called it magnetically activated and guided isotope separation, or MAGIS for short. And what we have shown is that this is a replacement for the calutron. So there, again, there are two ingredients that go into this. And I described one of them yesterday. And so, but if anyone didn't attend my talk yesterday, I'll briefly remind you. Uh, the first one is the process of optical pumping invented by Alfred Kassler, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1966 for this work. Uh, he actually called it cooling by light, lumino refrigeration. What he meant by that is not translational cooling, as we imagine with laser cooling, but instead cooling the internal degree of freedom or removing entropy from the internal state. And entropy can be in different forms. Uh, in this case, entropy is of the, the fact that you have multiple states. And I'm, what I'm showing here is a, an, a source of atoms on the upper part of the picture uh, creating an atomic beam. So we vaporize an element and make an atomic beam. And then we intersect it with a laser, which we call the pump laser, which is tuned on atomic resonance. Initially coming out of the oven, the atoms are all in the ground state. And we, for the, in this picture, we choose a J equals one to J equals one transition. So there are three magnetic states, plus one, minus one, and zero in both this ground and the excited states. And the application of optical pumping is that by choosing the right polarization of the light, you can control the quantum selection rules. So for example, if we use right circularly polarized light, then the selection rule is that on absorption, delta M equals plus one. So as you go up, you have to go up one unit of magnetic moment of, in M and so, for example, if you're in the minus one state, you have to go up to the zero state. If you're in the zero state, you have to go up to the plus one state. The plus one state can't go anywhere, so it becomes dark. And what you can convince yourself is after several cycles of absorption and re-emission, uh, the atom, all the atoms will be pumped into a single uh, quantum state, which is M equal, in this case, M equals one. Now that that because it's a single state, it has zero entropy. The multiplicity is one. So you have en uh, entropy is logarithm of the multiplicity. And so you have zero entropy state. You start out with higher entropy in the internal state and now you've reduced the entropy. That's why Kassler called it cooling. You, you could do this same trick by, uh, by choosing a different polarization. You can pump it into the M equals zero state by using linear, linearly polarized light, uh, also relying on the fact that a zero to zero absorption is not possible in this system. Or you could go to the minus one state if you use left circularly polarized light. The other ingredient, and we use this ingredient for optical pumping, we use that to make a one-way wall yesterday for cooling purposes. But, uh, but now we're gonna use it for a different purpose. The other ingredient is magnetic field. And I didn't, uh, I didn't talk about this yesterday because in, in the lab, we use typically uh, pulsed fields for cooling purposes, like with the, uh, or, or we didn't need very large magnetic fields. But, but in, the, in, the, in the separation problem, we wanna make very large magnetic fields, Tesla or several Tesla fields, but the key thing, and that's why this is very different than the Calutron, we don't need these fields to, to exist over a large volume. We just need to be them to be close to the surface. And you can use that, you can do that with uh, permanent magnets. There are very powerful rare earth magnets that you can buy today that produce those kind of surface fields. And there's a particular geometry that maximizes the magnetic field on one side, and that's called a Hallbach array. Some of you may have heard about this. Uh, what I show in the left picture is uh, the magnetic field uh, uh, lines from uh, an array of magnets that are all aligned in the same direction from north to south. But if you take every magnet and you rotate by 90 degrees, so in this case, uh, if you look at the right picture, you, you start out on the left pointing to the left, 
then you rotate counterclockwise. So 90 degrees goes down, then another 90 degrees goes this way. I'm pointing, I guess I'm pointing in the wrong direction for your screen. And then 90 degrees more is up and so on. And by doing that, you actually can see how strong the magnetic field is on one side. That's actually used as a good refrigerator magnet because it'll stick to your refrigerator better. Now we, we use thousands and thousands of these magnets to assemble arrays of what we call magnetic guides. So this is the basic idea of Magis, and this is uh, published and patented, so I'm not telling you anything secret. Uh, the, the idea is, is actually simple, but it surprisingly had not been realized before. And, and that's what and what makes it work is the following. So you again have a source of atoms shown on the left, uh, where we vaporize the element in a in a crucible or an oven, and that makes vapor, an atomic beam. Um, in in the picture that I'm showing, uh, the there's a laser beam, and the laser uh, is tuned to optically pump only one isotope. And I, I, this is just generally, I'm not speaking yet about a particular atom. Uh, we, the reason we can do that is because of a frequency shift called the isotope shift. So even though the frequencies of, of the transitions are almost, the, they are shifted with respect to each other due to the different nuclear mass. And those differences are maybe a part in 10 to the five out of the optical frequency, but that still corresponds to one or so one gigahertz. So one can easily tune a laser so that it only affects one isotope and not the others because of this isotope shift. As long as the Doppler profile of the atomic beam is less than the isotope shift, you can do it. So what we do is we optically pump with a, a laser and that puts it in the right magnetic state. Let's, let's say in the M equals plus one state. We know that state is repelled by the magnetic field. Now, if you look at the guide, you can see that they are slightly curved, and you can see the orientation of the magnets is in the Hallbach configuration that I described. So actually, if your detector is on the right, your collector, not detector, or detector, but you can collect on the right-hand side, there's no line of sight from the left-hand side to the right-hand side that moves in a straight line. So in a, in a vacuum chamber under sufficiently good vacuum, you can neglect collisions, the mean is long enough. So atoms will travel in a straight line and they can't reach from the oven to the collector. But if we now magnetize the atoms of that we want by optical pumping, <laughs> now as they come in close to the magnetic array, they don't actually hit it. They, they, they reach some classical turning point because their kinetic energy is, is low enough that they are repelled by the magnetic field and they bend. So now we've created a curve trajectory and it can reach our collector. On the other hand, the other states, which would be in this case, either M equals zero or M equals minus one, the zero case is shown in the upper uh, dashed line where it's unaffected by the magnetic field. So it just crashes into the magnets. And on the right, on the bottom one, we see the minus one where it's attracted. So it's pulled in. And we cover these magnetic arrays with aluminum foil so they, they don't get dirty. We can replace the aluminum foil after a while. By doing such an array, not, not a single channel, but many channels, we can collect uh, quite efficiently. And, and, and at the output, we should have quite pure isotopes. Now, the advantage of this is that we can do this optical pumping with low power semiconductor lasers at an efficiency of a few photons per atom, typically. And we can polarize them with nearly 100% efficiency. So virtually every desired atom is polarized, magnetized. And then we are separating them in a, magnetic, a surface field, which is acting on the magnetic moment. So unlike the calutron that separates by charge to mass ratio, we separate by magnetic moment to mass ratio. And because the masses are in fact almost the same, but the magnetic moment, we can even change a sign. We can go from positive to zero to negative. So that gives us a big lever arm 
as opposed to the Calutron, because the Calutron, you're stuck with charges always the same, just one fundamental charge. And so you're really only depending on mass differences, which are tiny typically. Typically for heavier atoms, they're on the order of 1% or less, half a percent. Whereas in our case, we can have uh, even change the sign of that ratio. Uh, also, because we use permanent magnets, there's no currents, so we don't use any electricity except for vaporizing the element. And the lasers are solid state lasers, which have use them about the same power as an average light bulb. Okay, so now I want to talk about some history, because as you may have realized already, I love history, science, and generally, but mostly of science. Uh, this picture, which I found from the web, uh, is, is of the pointsman. So what is the pointsman? That was a very important job in the past. Now it's probably done by a, an automatic switch in a computer. But you see here a picture of railroad tracks, and uh, the pointsman was responsible for switching the tracks. So when a train was coming down uh, and had to go one way, the pointsman would move a lever and that would divert the train. Otherwise, it would keep going on the same path. This is a very important job, and if the pointsman didn't do it right, we could have some bad consequences. In fact, if you look at the subtitle here, you kind of wonder what happens when pointsman has a cup of tea. Maybe that's not such a good idea. But anyway, uh, that so that, that turns out the, the, the historic pointsman of the railways was very common in the 19th century British Empire. And in fact, uh, James Clerk Maxwell was very interested in the pointsman. Uh, and uh, supposedly from, from reading letters, it's clear that that was his original motivation for Maxwell's demon. The reason is that uh, he wasn't thinking necessarily initially about cooling uh, very artificial situations, but he was thinking about this problem where uh, he was interested in the idea of free will, that, that a person that there is that free will could change the future. And uh, that's very different than a Newtonian point of view, where if you say you know the position and the momentum of a particle at time t equals zero, and you know the equations of motion, you can predict where it's going to be in, in the future. So that would be a deterministic system. Maybe not predictable, because you can have chaos, but it certainly is deterministic. Uh, but Maxwell was interested in the idea that maybe the future is deterministic. Maybe you can affect it by some external agent, which would be the pointsman. And, Ma and Maxwell, in fact, envisioned a microscopic pointsman who could move uh, effectively uh, the direction, alter the direction of atoms or gas phase particles in such a way. And so, in a way, we think of the, um, of Magus is maybe even closer to Maxwell's demon than the problem of cooling because that's where Maxwell started thinking about it. And what we start doing is imagining this atomic pointsman getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And my, my smallest font, you can't see it because it's atomic sized font. But uh, we shrink now this pointsman to the size of atoms. And, and the pointsman is a laser beam. And, but it can control the direction of this train, the train is now just an atom. So, so in a very real way, you understand this uh, in terms of uh, in terms of Maxwell's demon, and also in terms of entropy. In this case, the entropy is not the translational entropy, as in a cooling problem. This is instead entropy of mixing. So, if you have two species in this, like or, or multiple species that are mixed together then if you can demix them, that's entropy reducing action. And that's what we are doing. And, and in, in the same way that Maxwell was concerned about, you know, the second law of thermodynamics, this applies here as well. So of course, Maxwell didn't know about isotopes, um, but, or how you would do this in practice, but this comes back to exactly the same way of thinking. In other words, isotope separation ultimately is, is an entropy reducing process. And that changes the way you think about it. And it also changes in practice how you do it. All right. With that in mind, uh, again, we propose this idea. 
realized it, I realized it um, maybe uh, shortly after we demonstrated the cooling, actually, I realized that, that this is, uh, this could be useful for other purposes. And we chose to demonstrate this on highly depleted lith lithium. So lithium seven is uh, one of two stabilized types of lithium. Uh, lithium seven has a natural abundance of about 92.5%. The rest is lithium six. And actually, uh, every water-cooled nuclear reactor requires highly depleted lithium at a purity of 99.95% or better because uh, you need to buffer the pH of the water uh, when you add boric acid. Boric acid boron is a, is a neutron absorber. It's used to moderate the neutrons in, in a reactor. But, uh, but if you had boric acid, it would, it would be corrosive to the reactor. Uh, so you have to... Um, neutralize the pH and you do that with lithium hydroxide. But if you use lithium six, then you get, you form tritium and tritium will exchange with hydrogen. You get tritiated water, which is environmental problem. So uh, nuclear reactors, every water nuclear reactor needs highly depleted lithium. So we thought that was a good case. And, and also it didn't hurt that we already had all the lasers for lithium in my lab because we were doing lithium cooling. So this was an easy one to start with. And together with uh, my postdoc at the time, Bruce Klapoff, and former student, Tom Mazur, well, who's now Dr. Mazur, um, we predicted that in a single, in a short machine, we could, we could take out all the lithium-6, uh, almost. We could get down to 99.95 or better with the scalability of many kilograms a year and at the efficiency of a few photons per atom. And the experiment verified that, confirmed that we uh, reached that purity, actually higher, um, but we quoted that purity of 99.95. The scalability and the efficiency were as predicted. And this was published in uh, Nature Physics in 2014 and, uh, and issued a patent in about a year, very fast U.S. patent. It was actually interesting. One of the referees uh, gave us a hard time because he he didn't believe that it would that it would be scalable, and so uh, we argued that it would be, and now we've proven it. But at the time, of course, it was a demonstration experiment because we were only doing very small quantities. But nevertheless, it showed that it did work. And we back then we analyzed and we showed that Magis can separate isotopes of almost every almost any element in the periodic table, uh, and it, except when you can't make an atomic beam or the ground state can't be excited with a laser. So we can't do noble gases like, uh, like um, helium or, or argon or, or uh, neon because uh, you can't get a laser in the uh, X, well, deep UV, very deep UV, EUV. Um, and also certain elements uh, don't, not, don't normally form atomic beams, like chlorine is usually out of a bottle is Cl2 and so on. So in those cases, it's optical pumping. But other than that, we can pretty much do everything that we've looked at. Uh, the question is, what do we want to do? And also interesting to analyze the figure of merit. And on that note, uh, isotopic purity is actually much higher than the Calutron in principle. Uh, scalability to required quantities is is very good, and efficiency and cost is really orders of magnitude, typically around three orders of magnitude better than the calutron. And so, uh, on it wins on every on everything except one thing is complexity. Uh, it's not a general purpose machine. You have to have a Magis machine for each element because it has its own particular lasers. So after that work was done, and you know, in, in academia, usually you publish, you finish a work, publish it, maybe you patent it, and then you move on to something else. But in this case, in this particular case, I felt that there was a really strong reason to actually do much more than that because of the urgency for getting these isotopes. And so after thinking about this, uh, some, I decided to start a nonprofit foundation. And I called it the Pointsman Foundation, which you can now understand for historical reasons. Uh, that's our logo, which I drew. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't, but that's our logo. And our website is www.pointsman.org. Uh, the Pointsman Foundation is a non-for-profit non research organization. And 
at least as our starting point, we're going to use we use the efficiency technology to greatly reduce the cost of separated isotopes, making uh, life saving therapies and diagnostics readily available to the global medical community. And uh, this was there was a review article of about our work in physics today, but it's quite old by now, and I'm hoping that there will be short, soon a, an updated review article because we've made a lot of progress. So as a foundation, we have a president and a CEO, and I'm very pleased we were able to recruit recently uh, Dr. Marianne Rankin. Uh, Marianne was Dean of College of Natural Sciences for a long time, over 17 years at UT Austin. And she was the one who gave me the money initially to do the Magis uh, demonstration. So she has believed in this work from the very beginning. She then uh, became leader of the National Math and Science Initiative. And most recently, for eight or nine years, she was provost uh, at the University of Maryland in College Park and has now stepped down from that due to a change in leadership. So she took on this role. And she has a very long established track record of leadership. Um, I serve as chairman of the board of the foundation, and I'm a professor of physics, but also a professor of medicine, pediatric and diagnostic medicine at the Dell Medical School. Stephen Abrams is our pediatrician. Uh, he's also at Dell Medical School, and I'll say a word about his work in a moment. Mark Epstein is a uh, professor of surgery, plastic surgery. So Mark will help make us all look pretty when we get old. No, just joking. Uh, and... Uh, Peter Fox is a radiologist, uh, at, uh, director of a research imaging institute. He operates cyclotrons and is very familiar with medical imaging. Joseph Jersik is from Columbia Medical School. He's an oncologist, deals with uh, hematological, like leukemia, um, malignancies. And Doug Stone, may, some of you may know, is a, is a theoretical physicist from Yale who's a friend and supporter and has been very instrumental in, in, in moving forward. We also have an excellent advisory board, scientific advisory board with Stephen Chu. Um, everyone knows Steve Chu, uh, who uh, won a laser cooling and trapping for that, shared the Nobel Prize in Physics in 97. Ted Hench um, also won the Nobel Prize in 2005 for the optical frequency comb. Raymond Orbach is a former uh, uh, director of the DOE Office of Science and, and university president. Neil Lane uh, is a um, former director of the National Science Foundation and uh, the US Science Advisor in the Clinton administration. And Daniel Zeifman is uh, at the Weizmann Institute. He was uh, president of the Weizmann Institute and now head of the Israeli Science Foundation. And every all these, these people have been very helpful in advising us. So what are we doing at the Pointsman Foundation? Um, but let me just say that there are um, great advances in cancer therapy. We still don't have a cure, but there's great promise of targeted radioisotopes. The idea behind targeted radioisotopes is that you have some uh, some molecule, like a monoclonal antibody, but it could be other 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 targeting molecules that are designed to find and attach to uh, to cancer, to tumors inside the body, wherever they are, because they express a certain uh, antigen that they attach to. So um, you can design them, you can find uh, targeting molecules that will attach to multiple uh, multiple uh, of these uh, potential site binding sites. Um, that by itself doesn't accomplish anything, but if you attach to that a radioisotope that emits a high energy electron beta particle or an alpha particle, or in some cases gamma, then it will kill the tumor locally. And uh, what what is really advanced in, in the last few years is the design of these targeting molecules, but the field has been held back by the availability and cost of the isotopes, which we will solve. Uh, and the isotope that's gonna solve these problems is lutetium-177. Perhaps you haven't heard of it. Lutetium is a lanthanide uh, on, in the periodic table. It's right, it's, it's exactly to the right of the ytterbium, which most of you have heard about. Uh, uh, lutetium-177 is a radioactive isotope. It has a half-life of one week, so that's convenient for producing it at a reactor and sending it anywhere in the world. Uh, it emits uh, a beta uh, with an energy of about half an MeV, which gives you a range in tissue below one millimeter, and it also has some small branch 
gamma emissions, which can be used for medical imaging. Uh, there's been an explosion of activity in the last few years. This is actually, this number. these numbers are outdated. This is from uh, 2015, and now it's, it's much, much more. Uh, the way one produces lutetium-177 is you, can, you have to start from a stable isotope precursor, a target. And you put it in a nuclear reactor, and you can have two ways to do it. One is your terbium-176, which absorbs a neutron, uh, makes your terbium-177, which decays in a, in, a, in a couple of hours, to lutetium-177. That's called the indirect route, and, and it makes very pure lutetium-177 because you can remove the ytterbium by chemistry, what's called radiochemistry. Um, lutetium, the other pathway is to use the stable isotope lutetium-177, which absorbs a neutron and makes directly lutetium-177. Now, if you, if you see the, the cross-section here is enormous. It's over 2,000 barns, and that's thousands of times higher than typical nuclear cross-section. So this is a very, very efficient process. The reason people haven't used it up till now is because you have two problems. One is chemistry can no longer remove lutetium-177 from lutetium-176. So you typically make low specific activity material. Uh, the other problem is that you co-produce a long-lived impurity, uh, which is lutetium-177M, and that has a half-life of, uh, of 160 days. That's a big problem. Uh, what we can do is actually uh, remove, we can imagine just to remove the 177 in a hot cell. But, but first we have to start with the terbium 176. And that's what we're doing now. And in fact, when we analyze that, it's very uh, well suited to the Magis method because the ground state is non-magnetic. So even though there's many isotopes of naturally occurring isotopes of the terbium, if we do nothing to them, they won't get through the Magis machine because they're non-magnetic. They just can't get through. Uh, the oven is pretty low temperature, convenient, like a like lot, lot of alkalis. It's non-toxic, and we can use a simple laser scheme to optically pump it to a long-lived metastable state. <clears throat> and I can report now in Austin that is in production now, and we are achieving uh, over 99.7%, I think soon we will be over 99.9% purity. That far surpasses the, the requirement of 99.5%. So this is what's needed. And just last month, uh, just over a month ago, on January 10th of 2022, this is now public information, we signed an agreement with Eckert and Ziegler. This is a uh, company, it's an international company, but based in Berlin. Uh, called formerly Eckert and Ziegler Radio Pharma, GmbH, DR, uh, has signed a joint venture, an exclusive long-term supply agreement for Euterbium-176 with Atom Mines, LLC, an innovative producer of enriched Euterbium isotopes and a subsidiary of the nonprofit Pointsman Foundation, both based in Austin, Texas. So here's an unusual situation that we we started out with a nonprofit foundation, but now we incubated it and spun off a for-profit company that is majority owned by the foundation. This is a model that we're going to repeat now with multiple isotopes. And in fact, in the future, Pointsman Foundation will be the majority holder of multiple isotope companies, which will bring in a lot of revenue, and that will pay for projects that have no business model. So uh, even though we're a nonprofit, a nonprofit can still make money um, and use it if it if it fits in with the mission. It, it also is not taxed. It, it has to be looked at each case, but that is that is what we're doing. So here's some of our projects at the Poinson Foundation, and we are getting going on several of them. I mentioned cancer therapy. Uh, the reason I think that lutetium-177, in a way, it will be the ultimate isotope is because the, the nuclear cross-section is so big that once we produce this, the cost and availability of neutrons will be irrelevant almost. And that will make radioisotopes a, an, an available commodity. Uh, medical imaging, there are advances in imaging, both of gammas called the SPECT and also uh, PET scans, positron emission tomography. Those radioisotopes complement other methods such as MRI and 
uh, computer tomography, CT scans. Um, prevention of iron deficiency, and I'll say a little more in closing about that. Uh, clean water and air, not necessarily related to isotopes, but there's some. Uh, I have some patents on how to do that in a new way. Um, treating infectious disease. This is an area where uh, actually I think the Poinson Foundation could have a big impact, and I, but I, I will talk about this at a later time. Uh, not viral infections, but bacterial infections uh, and uh, persistent chronic bacterial infections and perhaps even tuberculosis. Uh, and early cancer detection, which is very important because many types of cancers are, uh, as they develop in the body, especially in deep, uh, deep organs in the body like the pancreas and the liver uh, and the ovaries don't show any, any signs at all until it's too late. So early cancer detection has tremendous uh, potential for improving and saving lives. So um, the one topic I'm gonna say a few words and then I'll end uh, is, is iron deficiency. Because perhaps you were not aware of this and maybe some years ago, I was not aware of this. Uh, in fact, iron deficiency is a worldwide health problem. It affects over 2 billion people worldwide have iron deficiency, many of them develop iron anemia, which is a more serious condition of deficiency. And 50% or more of all children in the world, that's half, one of every two children in the world suffers from iron deficiency. That's an amazing number, bad, amazingly bad. Uh, it causes severe developmental problems and permanent brain damage in growing toddlers. But this is a preventable problem. In fact, it could be solved by iron fortification of foods and beverages, but you need to assess the bioavailability. What I mean by bioavailability, what I should say is just absorption, is you can take iron supplement pills, but they don't necessarily get absorbed in your body. And uh, in fact, um, our, my collaborator and pediatrician, Steve Abrams advised uh, a country I won't name the country, but they spent $5 billion on iron fortification for children, which was literally flushed down the toilet because they didn't do it right. But luckily, one can do this correctly. The way to, the way to diagnose it and make sure that it really is absorbed in the body is you use uh, stable but rare isotopes of iron. Iron 57 and iron 58 are stable, so they're completely safe to use. They're just like iron. Iron 57 is known to people from uh, Mossbauer spectroscopy. It has a natural abundance of about 2%. Iron 58 is about 0.2%. Uh, if you put them intentionally into, into food or beverage, typically into a beverage like orange juice, and then you conduct large scale population studies of children and measure the absorption in the blood. Uh, now in the past, the bottle, there were two bottlenecks. The, this, this was proven by Steve Abrams and by other people. So the mythology, mythology is completely proven, but it could never be implemented. The reason is that uh, of the cost and availability. So first of all, these iron isotopes are very expensive. They cost typically a milligram, cost typically $100 a milligram. So that means that to conduct large scale population studies is, is just impractical. Um, so using MAGIS technology, we can produce these enriched isotopes at much lower cost. Secondly, they have to use a very expensive mass spectrometer, a multi-million dollar machine that can only analyze probably 20 samples per day because of the very extensive sample preparation that is needed. Uh, because you're only looking at in a mass spectrometer at charge to mass ratio, so you have to avoid interferences, and that requires very extensive uh, sample preparation. But we, we believe that with ultra-sensitive laser spectroscopy of iron and simple sample pre preparation, because we're, we, we don't care about the mass spectra, we're actually looking at atomic fluorescence, uh, we could use small blood samples and, and scale it up to very large population studies. And in such a way, we could really determine country by country how best to fortify foods and beverages to prevent iron deficiency. And once we can do iron deficiency, um, we can go on to, uh, to calcium and to zinc. Those are, zinc is especially important. Uh, there are real problems with zinc deficiencies. 
Uh, beyond that, there are many others, uh, many other um, things we can do, such as detecting at very low, very high sensitivity, uh, toxic heavy metals. And those cause problems in, in everyone, but especially in children. For example, arsenic can get into rice and accumulation of, of rice uh, in, in the arsenic in the body has very severe consequences. In fact, there was just a recall of baby food because of contaminated arsenic and rice, but one needs more sensitive methods of detection. So this is really using atomic physics in a way, not very, not even new atomic physics. Maybe the laser, maybe the laser technology is new, but generally speaking, we can do so much uh, to help uh, to help humanity and children, especially. Finally, in the in five minutes, I want to just tell you about our longer term view of this Pointsman lab. And I, I wrote an article in uh, in Physics Today in 2018 which I call Let's Cre Recreate Bell Labs. And I encourage you to read that. You can actually download, if you don't have access to physics today, if you just look at a Pointsman website under news, you can download the article and read it. And it, it was, uh, it actually attracted a lot of attention, but you know, people can, it's easy to propose things, but in the end you have to say, or how can you pay for it? So we have a way to pay for this uh, through our isotope sales. So I think it's not just, it's not just a pipe dream. Um, but, but for those of you, most, most of you in the audience probably are too young to even remember uh, Bell Labs. Uh, I and, and Vanderlei Bagnado, I'm sure we, we both remember that those were the days that that was considered the best place to, to get a job, was to work at Bell Labs. Bell Labs uh, ran for many, many years, but it kind of ended, in, at least in practice, in the late, mid to late 90s. Uh, but I encourage you to read the story of Bell Labs because it's really fascinating. It's called the Idea Factory, Bell Labs in the Great Age of American Innovation. Uh, and Bell Labs is one example. There were other research labs like IBM Research and Xerox and others, but, but this story is about Bell Labs. You can read about how fiber optics were invented and developed there and at Corning, and now all, all op optical communication, all communication long range is done with optical fibers. Uh, long history of, of basic science and, and, and recognized by Nobel Prizes, most recently Arthur Ashkin for optical tweezers. And so what I proposed at the time and now is really becoming true is that we have a different model for innovation and that the, the parent organization is the nonprofit foundation. Uh, and that was one of the reasons that ultimately the Bell Labs failed is because it was a corporation. But by keeping this as a nonprofit foundation, the Pointsman Foundation, uh, as we incubate and, and spin off companies, our first company is Adam Mines. We, we incubated it initially with philanthropy and then got investors. And now, now it is revenue and which flows back uh, to the foundation and also some to the investors so they make money. Uh, and this model will be replicated with other isotopes. And this will also give us, it'll give us the money to do two things. One is to develop the other projects that I listed, but also to develop a, the Pointsman Labs. Ultimately, I hope to develop a, a network of labs, which we, where we have a scientific staff, which will split their time between directed projects and creative research. Uh, this will be hopefully stable and sustainable with funding provided by income with our spinoff companies. Um, so unlike Bell Labs, which ultimately failed because of that problem, uh, we, we don't have to worry about the stock market and we can just be a stable foundation. And in fact, we're hoping to work with other large foundations and we have discussions going on now, right now, with some of the largest foundations uh, in the US. Uh, th if, if we can bring everyone together this would make a semi-academic environment, a place for young people that would be not, not exactly academia, but not exactly industry. And, um, and we're supplementing this with philanthropic donations. That effort is led by Marianne Rankin, who has a long track record, a successful track record doing that. Um, I'll just say that this, this kind of incubation can avoid the, a lot of problems that companies have where you, try, you have to get to profit, profit very, very quickly uh, but I won't say more about this. Uh, finally, uh, this can also address a real problem, at least in the US, that 
uh, faculty have a very hard time of starting new projects. So what we hope to do is, is award uh, research projects to outstanding tenured faculty members uh, to conduct experiments at a pointsman lab where they will have a team of postdocs. They'll, they'll have to spend some time, maybe eight weeks, six to eight weeks out of the year at the pointsman lab, uh, but they will otherwise supervise that, that group remotely. We've learned very well how to work remotely, like I'm giving my lecture on Zoom. Not that it's ideal, but it can be done. And th there will be opportunity for consulting and collaboration with pointsman staff. So I'm gonna end exactly on the hour on time. Uh, this is the Pointsman Foundation, uh, www.pointsman.org. And the story that I started yesterday uh, started in 1871, and now we're in 2022. Uh, these ideas really uh, go beyond, I think far beyond just Maxwell's demon and cooling. And I, I think Maxwell himself would be pleased by this. Uh, he died very young of cancer. Maybe today we would have been able to save him. So I will uh, end here and thank you for your attention. So uh, thank you for your presentation and con congratulates for the, your amazing technique and the uh, foundation. Thank you very much. So now we're gonna open for questions on the audience or in the chat also. Bundele, please. Dalila, can you come? Hello. So, um, I have a question about your technique. So, you're talking about impurity of 0 0.05. Uh, you have 99.5. 95 purity in the isotopes. And I don't understand where this impurity comes from since you are separating magnetic states with lasers and this is so straight. So, so, um, so why, why isn't it higher? Well, in, in, in the experiment uh, that we did in 2014, um, we were limited by our signal to noise. So when we quote an impurity, actually that's a, a lower bound. It could be higher, but that's the best we could. We couldn't quote a higher purity just because of our signal to noise. Uh, in principle, it should be higher, uh, but, but there could be multiple reasons. I mean, um, any collision with background, if, if there's a background gas molecule uh, air, say it, will, it could collide with, with uh, atoms inside the guide and deflect them. So uh, I think these are technical issues that we could improve, but but there's not if there's no need to get better, then we there, then we don't have to worry about it. it that, that's good enough. Uh, we only need to do it as good as is required. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I have another question: Is how do yes. you store the pure isotope? Since it is so difficult to separate, how do you store it to avoid, like, oh. you know, oxidation or whatever? Oh, um, well, uh, Thank you. The, uh, the, typically the, um, the, uh, the isotopes, first of all, we, we can store it in, uh, under vacuum, so in metallic state. But, but very often uh, people want to have it in some chemical form, like people sometimes want to have it as an oxide. Or, or a chloride. So in fact, the lutetium-177 is typically shipped as lutetium-177 chloride. So uh, th that's not a problem. The, the, uh, the only, the stable isotopes have no shelf life. They are completely stable. The radioisotopes, of course, will decay. So you have to ship them very quickly uh, by FedEx or some other fast carrier to where they need to go because the clock is ticking and, and they start to decay. But, but that's why lutetium has a half-life of one week is long enough to process it and to ship it. Thank you. Any further questions? On the lake, can come? Hey, Mark, thank you for the nice talk. Hi, um, Vandu. I know you, I know how how much you put in time and 
efforts to make these two goals. So I always thought that uh, atomic physics uh, is the everything we need for life, and uh, we are saving a lot of life. And being a physicist is helping humanity. And I really believe, you know, you know, I have my own projects here in biophotonics and everything. But uh, I have uh, one question. When are we going to use uh, radioactive... Oh, first of all, let me tell that uh, uh, the so-called nuclear medicine is a very serious problem because uh, there are very few places in the world that produce ra radioisotopes, and everybody uses. And uh, Mark may know that uh, the main source of radioisotopes was Russia some time ago. I don't know if it still is Russia, the, well, the source of not, radioisotopes. Well, not so much. Uh, maybe maybe uh, stable isotopes from Russia, mostly. Yeah. And... Uh, and if I know, if I understand correctly, they are stopping some of the old machines, which means that yeah. many of the diagnoses done with radioactive isotopes may become much more expensive than today. So mm -hmm. for a country like us, it means that uh, nuclear medicine may be prohibitive if there are no initiatives to produce right. uh, in a comfortable economic way. Right, right. So I think in this sense uh, is a very important initiative and uh, comes from understanding the physics of uh, yeah. the atoms and everything. My question is on the science part. When you're going to use a radioactive isotope for infection, um, that's a very delicate thing because uh, you have many constraints. The mm -hmm. lifetime of the isotope, the threshold of damage for the yeah. normal tissue. Otherwise, you're going to kill the yeah. infection and the guy that has the infection. Right. Right. So that's right. one question, right? Right. And, uh, and so when you choose the correctly radioisotope, you have to be very much right. concerned about those things. Yeah. Yes. Right. I so... In the list of things, cancer, we know, we have to kill. Either we kill the cancer or the cancer kills the patient. But right. infection is another domain. And uh, I think uh, it's very important to yeah. hear from you what you think. Yes, so when I, when I say infection, uh, the, the real problem with a bacterial infection or fungal infections it, or uh, is is that the bacteria uh, it um, can can um, act collectively and form a very resistant uh, uh, collective uh, community called a biofilm, and the biofilms are uh, thousands of times, if not more, resistant to any antimicrobials. They protect themselves. And that is the cause of chronic infection. It, it's, a, it's a real crisis in healthcare because, uh, first of all, they, and we've discussed this, uh, they, they, uh, they will form on surfaces. So uh, implants or indwelling devices like catheters cause uh, urinary tract infections. And we, we've actually just demonstrated, we haven't published this yet, but with my a collaborator, who's an expert on biofilms, what we've shown is that we take a surface, uh, this is done in vitro, but we do take a surface and we put a radioisotope, a beta emitter, sulfur 35, on a surface, we can inhibit the, the formation of a biofilm. Even though the, it has the right conditions to form, it doesn't form. And we're gonna publish this very soon, I hope, when, when we have enough data, but it, it is convincing that this does work and we, we understand it, we think what's going on. And if this, if this is true, this could be a way to, um, to minimize chronic infections. So the source of chronic infections are, are like I said, from implants or indwelling devices. Uh, of course, uh, some of those are, are, um, are not, uh, they, they are uh, elective. People, people elect to have certain implants done, like teeth implants or things like that. In, in other cases, people have chronic infections, diabetic wounds that don't heal, or other 
other uh, uh, chronic situations like cystic fibrosis. I mean, these are these chronic uh, conditions are very dangerous to to health. People lose limbs; they get ampu amputations. So, uh, it's not proven, though. You're you're right, uh, and and it'll take many years of effort and it'll require FDA approval or in other countries, uh, medical approval to approve such, such use of isotopes. So could you, could you make, I mean, this is a dream that may never happen. Uh, I, I'm not sure because uh, the, the pro in the end, a lot of what determines whether something becomes a useful drug is that the, the big companies have to decide to invest in it. For example, the lutetium 177, the reason it's, the reason it's going so strong is Novartis has invested like eight billion dollars in in making F, in drug, drugs for cancer therapy, but if they don't see enough money in, in infectious disease, they may not. It may not happen. It may never happen. But so I'm not sure right now. But but I think at least from our standpoint, we can make the radioisotopes much much more available and and cost effective. Uh, whether they'll be actually used, I can't say. But, but we have a problem, I mean, we really do have a problem. We're, we're entering an age of antibiotic resistance. And, you know, uh, I just heard a number yesterday by a health expert uh, because um, before antibiotics the, and, and vaccines, the life expectancy of people was around 45 years old. Um, one out of every four children didn't reach the age of five. Nowadays, our life expectancy is over, average is over 80, and life expectancy of children is, is dramatically different. But, but it, it is scary that if, if we don't have, if we, you know, if we have antibiotic resistance, and that's a growing problem, we have to find an alternative. And uh, I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe it'll be something else. So we're, we just don't know. I, I'm not as sure about this, but, I, but at least we can do everything we can to make these uh, inexpensive and available. No, I agree. That's a very important topic. Finally, is a comment uh, about uh, uh, starting again, Bell Lab type of uh, enterprise. Uh, how is that? Is that really going? Or is already established? Or no, is no, still on the No, it's not, it's not yet going. It's not, it's not yet going. There, but there's a lot of I, I would say there's growing interest. Uh, I have interest by leaders of, of academia, university presidents, but they can't pay for it. But I have former uh, former directors of the National Science Foundation and the NIH who believe this is necessary. And, and I have uh, potentially a conversation with the largest foundations in, in, in the US that uh, if, we can, if we can all agree and so if not, if they don't want to participate, then I think Pointsman Foundation could do this on a smaller scale. It's not all or nothing. <clears throat> so if we can raise the money, uh, it's, it's actually not to, to the, the, the point about getting faculty fellows. It serves two purposes. It, one is that it will allow the creative researchers to, to, to start new projects. That's very, very hard, as you know. Um, to it, it, it's always hardest to start a new project because the joke is that when you submit a proposal and it's rejected, they said you were, we're rejecting your proposal because this has never been done before. So, uh, <laughs> and but that's true is that it's very hard to start a new project. But the second thing is that we we want to have uh, a we we want these uh, these senior people to help us recruit people, help us recruit postdocs that then we will hire at the Pointsman Foundation, at the Pointsman Lab, because ultimately it's the young people that we want to hire. It's the young people who will be the, the next brightest, the next greatest ideas will come from probably from young people. And so uh, I think it's, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that we're, I think we're on a good path, but I would like it to go faster. But, but on the other hand, uh, we have a source of income that will grow and the the I think we have we will get attention by by the right people I hope um, I'm I'm pretty determined to do this and I think that we will do it I I hope it's not going to take too long because I'd like to enjoy it too. 
Okay, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. It was a very nice talk, you know, like complementing all these uh, topics that we see in quantum fluids. Thank you very much, and uh, we all appreciate your time if you give us the two talks. Thank you. Yeah, yes, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad. Thank you. Uh, any further questions from the audience? Oh, we have two. Student first. You can come here, please, because of the can see you. Are there, are there more questions? Okay. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, my question is not actually about the, the, the physics. It's more about the, the, the philanthropical uh, approach that you're doing. Um, you, you said about um, talking with the FDA and other, other types of, of governmental um, associations in in the U.S., but uh, th this project you're you're trying to um, kind of expand it uh, uh, further than the U.S. and try to talk about uh, with with gov government agencies in Europe or in other countries as well for like um, money and and whatever because uh, I've. I think it's a nice idea, and I don't know how much w it will cost, and, and if um, it is necessary to be based only on the U.S. and not like try to give it a global effort. Um, yeah. Um, expectation, uh, I guess. So I'm not sure what your what is your question. Uh, if you're trying to, to reach to other countries as yeah. well as the yes. US. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for example, the iron deficiency project, uh, Stephen Abrams already, as a, as a pediatrician, already led some studies in Peru and in, in uh, India and in, uh, several uh, in a country in Africa, I forget which one. So he, he has gone outside the U.S. for this purpose but not, on, not yet on a big scale because they didn't have the funds or the isotopes available. And, um, um, but we are, um, we are talking to, um, uh, I, I think that, uh, I mean, he's already advised uh, one, con one, one federal government uh, outside the US. He, so he has connections. <laughs> These are more uh, his connections. I think specifically, uh, the iron iron deficiency project is clearly an international one because it's a global problem, and uh, we hope to work with there are organizations like the International uh, Nuclear Atomic Energy Agency, based in Vienna, that they have a nutrition a large nutrition project, um, but we'll have to see. I think we will do a pilot programs in the U.S. and then hopefully be able to expand it. This is going to take a lot of effort and money and and that's where we will need help from some of the biggest foundations like the gates foundation okay uh thank you uh very much and thank you for for the this effort thank you thank you yeah uh, do you have a more uh, time for two questions professor yes of course okay so professor Gamal. Oh, thanks for the nice talk uh, my question is about the efficiency of the project uh, when you separate things, of course, you, you must uh, lower the, the entropy of this separated material. And your equipment, of course, you must increase the entropy. So you show it that uh, uh, when you, uh, in the Maxo demo, that the, when you, uh, in your experiment, you calculate the exact entropy to, uh, to send the particles from one side, it compensates exactly for the entropy was generated. My question is about the efficiency of magis. Uh, once you separate a material, of course, you lower the entropy of this. So for instance, lithium-6 and lithium-7, when you separate, you lower the entropy of this uh, system. And uh, how much entropy is generated in your, in your equipment? I, s I say, how much uh, magis generate of entropy as compared to the entropy of the uh, system you separated. And yeah. uh, in, in um, response, uh, uh, yeah. how, uh, uh, is there any uh, improvement of, of magis or magis 
is so close to the uh, to the ideal efficiency that uh, uh, it's uh, it's over the problem you cannot right. improve much uh, your system i i think that uh, so the question is about efficiency we haven't really analyzed it so much from the entropy standpoint because uh, in the end what really matters for, for these things is uh, we, one measures efficiencies in other things. I mean, entropy is kind of an abstract concept. Uh, the, uh, the, the, I mean, for physicists, it's nice to talk about, but, but people in practice care about their energy bill, their electricity bill, and they care about uh, other things. So uh, in our case, it's, it's the, um, uh, you can measure efficiency like in number of photons per separated atom. And optical pumping is is the is really reaching a quantum efficiency close to one because, in principle, one spontaneous emitted photon can can uh, can make one separated atom. In principle, uh, we're we're very close to that. So, I don't think one can improve upon that. I think we have reached, in some sense, and uh, uh, I can't prove it to you formally, but I I don't think there will ever be a process that. I think you have to have some irreversible process, otherwise it can't work. And when you get to the level of, of photo, one, you know, one to one, one photon per one atom separated, that's as good as one can do. So, uh, so, there, so we've reached a limit, kind of a hard limit. Um, in terms of energy, um, the only energy consumption is really the vaporization of the, of the element. And I don't see how to avoid that. So. Um, I think we are close to the absolute limit, uh, it, and and it, it's a big breakthrough compared to previous methods. But I I, I mean there might be small improvements, and we are actually um, beyond what we have done, what we have published and patented. We have many trade secrets that I can't talk about, but we we've made small improvements, but they are more technical in nature. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Sure. Thank you, Professor. Uh, next question, please. So, hello, Mark. Thank you for, yes. for your lecture. I would like to ask you about uh, separation of molecules. First, is if it is possible to extend your technique to separate molecules with different isotopes in them? So, I don't know, heavy water and no normal water. And two, if you have any reason for doing so. <laughs> Um, we don't have any reason to separate molecules ourselves, no. I mean, uh, I can't think of, it, it would have to be a paramagnetic, uh, a paramagnetic molecule like, like oxygen, but, uh, but there's other methods. We, we don't, we, uh, we, I don't, I don't think our method would be the, a desirable one. It's, uh, it's, I mean, optical pumping is very complex it's, and, and um, it, it, it may be possible, I, I just don't know. And I, I don't think it's a direction we want to go to because it, the, the cases that we have that we think are interesting are all atomic based. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe partly it's my ignorance of molecules that I think molecules, you know, the joke is that, that, a, uh, that, that a diatomic molecule is, it has one atom too many. So I, 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 some people love molecules. I just don't understand them well enough. And I, and optical pumping may be possible, but I don't think we're, we're not going to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Any further questions? Mm, no. So we would like to thank you again for your very nice talk and uh, um, hope your company and uh, your work <laughs> can make more um, advance in the, in the science and the health. Are you Thank there? Thank you. Just quit. Thank you very much. OK. That's OK. Thank you. OK. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>